This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMIreland.com and ICRadioNetwork.com. Call us on 046-927-1212. Hello and we're back and we'd like to introduce uh, Max Egan. Max, good evening to you. How are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Good morning for me though. It's, uh, it's a different time of day over here, but I'm very well. It's very early over there. Max, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people, our listeners have, have, have heard you and your broadcasts and your, your website and your documentaries. We actually have one of your documentaries on our website as well. Very, very good. The Awakening documentary that you did. Well, for people who haven't really heard who Max Egan is, can you give us a, a quick uh, roundup as to your background and how you got involved in this? Well, I've been kind of involved in it most of my life. It was a hobby for me for many, many years. And then, as with many people, when 9-11 happened, I began to take it a little bit more seriously and started speaking out and making documentary films and figured it was time to get the message out to people. But um, I've been, spent most of my life as a, as a travelling musician, actually, and I've, I've travelled around and met lots of people and been able to look at life sort of from a different perspective to most people. Being a musician, you kind of live on the outside of society. I just became aware at a, at a very early age that, that nothing was, was the way they told us. So, like I said, it was kind of a hobby for me. But um, with what's been going on in the last 10 years or, or 12 years, it, it's gotten very, very serious. And so, like like many other people, I, I've, I've just been speaking out as much as I can, trying to alert people to the global situation and, and what we're really facing here. Because, you know, we're sort of going to hell in a handbasket, really. So... Yeah, I think we can turn it around pretty easily as well if, if people can just wake up to what's going on. But it's it's difficult for people to get their head around. And that's that's half the battle. Now, Max, I know you're a broadcaster and you have your own show, I believe, down in Australia as well. What's happening over there? Can you give us a, a heads up on what's happening? We we were on the Vince Eastwood show on Tuesday and we've been on Vince Vince show a couple of times and it's great getting um, an idea of what's happening in particular countries. So what's happening in your, your neck of the woods? Well, Australia is one of the countries that seems to have survived the financial meltdown that, that most of the rest of the world's gone through. But they seem to be uh, fixing that at the moment so that we don't survive at all. Um, Julia Gillard's just decided to, uh, to use most of Australia's economy to bail out Europe or Greece or something. I don't know. She's, um, she wants to give all our money to, to Europe now anyway, which would set us up for a nice financial crash probably next year, I think. Um, the most of the country's been turned into a mine at the moment, though. Uh, as with many countries, fracking has taken over. Uh, we've got most of our food bowl has just been signed over to foreign interests. This is a place called the Darling Downs in Queensland. That's earmarked for 30 open-cut mines. Uh, most of the place is, is being mined and fracked, and um, they're just extracting as many resources from the place as they can. It all ties in with the Jenna 21, um, getting people into the cities because they're destroying the groundwater so it will be impossible for people to live in the country. It's getting very, very on the edge over here. And it's happening right across the country. I've, I've actually just been across the country and I've seen some of the mines that they're putting in around the place. And the people are just being discarded left, right and centre. The government has no regard for the people at all. And, of course, we've been disarmed over here, so there's not a lot anybody can do about it. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the country's basically been turned into a mine. That, that's what I can see anyway. That's incredible. We, we are having the same problems over here. We're having fracking taking place down in the Lock Crew Basin, and we've asked somebody to come on the show to talk about it and what's happening what's involved. But, unfortunately, the person who we spoke to said, oh, well, we really don't want to come on your show because you're just a bunch of conspiracy theorists, and it actually affect their, 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 um, their plight, you know. And I thought, well, that's very nice. Thanks very much. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't call ourselves conspiracy theorists. We have gone this, gone through this uh, on a number of occasions. And the people who we do get on and speak to are people with real-life experience and documented proof in a majority of cases. Um, so I was just kind of narrow-minded on their side. But we seem to be experiencing exactly what you're experiencing. I don't know whether... You've been, you've heard about the Irish news, but we've, um, we didn't have a referendum regarding bailing out the banks over here. And during the week, we've just, um, given the banks, uh, which is the senior bondholders, which this debt was unguaranteed anyway, 700 million to them. Um, so Ireland is really, really going through 
um, a bad stage at the moment and we have another budget coming in which is going to affect even more people. Are you having the same thing in Australia where people are losing their homes and struggling and everything else? Yeah, not as bad over here yet, but it will be. I mean, with this bailout that Julia Gillard's got planned for, for Europe, yeah, it will, it will get very bad. Um, but, I mean, people are managing to keep their head above water here at the moment. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of artificially propped up. It, it's not going to last very long at all. And the fracking, everything that's going on around the world, and, and it, it's like the whole place is, is absolutely being strip mined. And what, what I'm realising is that, and I've been speaking about it a lot lately on the shows, is that there's a trust agreement that exists between ourselves and the government, but it's a personal thing. You know, I have a trust agreement that exists between myself and the government, so do you. So I can only deal with, with my perspective and my trust with them. It's an individual thing. That's why it's very, very difficult to to find a leader in amongst our populations everywhere. I mean, I could stand up and, and make my stand against the government, but ultimately it will only work for me. Everybody has to do it themselves. It's a personal thing because it's a trust trust agreement. It's a trust arrangement that we have with the government. And I've been helping uh, people understand that a little bit and the need for them to actually stand up and put our public trustees back in their correct position in, in the social hierarchy, which is that of trustees. That's what we're missing out on. That's what we're forgetting. And that's where the remedy lies. A lot of people are looking for remedies at law and remedies uh, in the legal system. And there is no legal remedy for anything that's happening. It's, it's got to be looked at from a perspective of trust. And when people can get their heads around that, that's, that's how we're going to heal things, I think. And I've been, I've been really looking at, uh, at that a lot lately and trying to bring that to a lot of people. And so have a lot of others like Dean Clifford in, uh, in, in Canada. Um, many people have been have been going down the trust law rabbit hole now, and it, it, it seems to be working. Can you, um, well, talking about Dean, funny enough, Dean was supposed to be on the show a couple of weeks ago, and we didn't hear anything from Dean. And then the other day, I received an email from Dean saying, sorry he couldn't come on the show, but he was actually, they locked him up for 19 days in jail. Yeah, I heard about that. I, heard, I haven't actually spoken to him since then. I, I, briefly, he said he was in jail for 19 days, but apparently he beat the charges. They just kind of held him there waiting for trial or something. That's right, yeah. So we'll get Dean back on and we'll have a chat with Dean. But can, for people who don't know, I found what you were talking about, about the trust, very interesting. Because we are looking at all different ways over here, from the Freeman movement or the sovereign movement, looking at ways to... And I wouldn't say circumvent the system, but just being sovereign and getting away from this commercial legalese world that we're all kind of tied up in. You know, parking tickets, speeding tickets, toll tickets, all this kind of commercial world. And obviously there's two different people, the flesh and blood human being and the actual straw man. Could you give us a 101 on the trusts and what they are and how you go about setting them up, really? Well, the thing is, with, with what's going on with all the tickets and all the fines and stuff we're getting, it's because our governments are broke because of this financial system. They've got to find more and more ways of extracting money out of the people to try to pay their debt. But the trust, the trust stuff, um, a lot of it is in your heart. A lot of it is basically knowing who and what you are. I mean, if you look at your birth certificate, and Dean will explain all this too, if you look at your birth certificate, what you see is that it's actually a three-part agreement. It's an agreement between your parents, yourself, and the government. So therefore it's a trust agreement because it's got three three parties. A contract has two parties. This has three parties, so it's a trust agreement. It's signed by the government, and that shows obligation by the government. So what you find when you look at your birth certificate is there's a legal person on the top of your birth certificate. That legal person is, well, you could call it a trust. You could call it a presumption of law. You could call it um, anything you want, really, a corporation, whatever you want. But that legal person is is how you interact with their corporate world. You use that legal person to do it because ultimately you're not the legal person, you're man. You know, you have a legal person, but, but it's not you. It's just, it's just a, a label that you can use. So getting your head around that is, is a big thing for most people as well to understand that they're not actually the name. You know, their name is man, your name is man, but you have a legal person. So, when you look at that legal person, what you find is that um, you're the sole shareholder of that legal person. You own all the equity in that name, and therefore you have the right to appoint yourself administration rights over that, that legal person, over that name. And all law that is uh, attempted to be forced upon you, like all, all statute law, this is just statute. It's not actual law because there's no injured party. In a, in a breach of an actual law, there needs to be an injured party. 
but in a breach of a statute, it doesn't. And you'll find that statutes are simply government regulations. They're just, just statute regulations that somebody wrote down on a piece of paper. So it's all contract law, because all of man's law is contract law. So because you own all the equity in that legal person, in that name, if, if the government isn't going to attempt to enforce statute law against you, you need to see the contract. You need to understand that you're dealing with contract law. And I've, I've gone in, in, in court cases and, and gone in and, and stood in this, this name, stood in, in man, who I am, and, and they've got no recourse. They've got nothing, nothing they can possibly do because um, you, it's true. I mean, you own all the equity in the name. If they're claiming they have administration rights over your name, <clears throat> you need to see a contract, basically. But as I said, this is a personal thing. I mean, I can stand in this myself. I can go to court. I can take the system on and stand in who I am myself, but I can't do it for you. And yeah. I can't really provide a, a, a template or a piece of paper or a way you can free yourself. A lot of people have been asking me for that. What's a template? Because I've said to them, and Dean said to them, you can actually send off an affidavit to the Attorney General or whoever it is, the head of your legal department in your country, and you can establish your freedom. And a lot of people want to be able to do this, but then they're not prepared to stand in it. And you have to be able to stand in it. Ultimately, it's in your heart. And I can tell you how to send the forms off, but if you don't know that you're free in your heart, then you might just get yourself in trouble. Personally, I don't need to send any forms off. I don't need to fill out anything that they tell me I need to fill out to establish my freedom. Because if I, if I have to fill out their forms that they're telling me to, to establish my freedom, then how free am I? You know, why do I have to participate in their system at all? I mean, it, it's kind of the attitude, well, look, I'm here, I'm man, I own all the equity in this name, who are you people? And, and show me proof of claim that you have any jurisdiction over me at all. Let's establish that before we can move forward. Because if you've dragged me into your court, you need to first establish jurisdiction. And as I own all the equity in this name, you know, show me. Show me how you've got jurisdiction. Don't you claim to be basing your legal system on the laws of God? Well, that, that, that's your Bible. And according to your Bible, God gave man dominion over the earth. And I'm man. So who, who are you people? Let's establish that straight away. And if you, if you can stand in that, then they've got no recourse. They've got nowhere to go from there. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, it, we, we've been looking just before you actually came on. I was just saying that to the listeners. Um, I got Gartner's Dictionary of um, Modern Legal Usage, which I was recommended to get, and I was just talking about the statutes and acts which, which they throw at us. Now, a statute, according to that dictionary, has the, carries the force of law, but it's not law. And if it carries the force of law, it means that only if it's consented by the governed. So if we don't consent to it, it doesn't apply to us. Well, that's exactly it. I mean, I've gone into court and I've said, um, I'm, I'm confused as to why I'm here. Is this not a court of law? And the judge will say, yes, it's a court of law. And I say, well, could you please uh, tell me which law I've broken? And they can't, because they can't name a statute as a law. If a judge names a statute as a law, then the judge has committed fraud on the bench. So if you can establish that straight away, as soon as you get in there, you know, establish your administration rights and and. Ask them to tell you what actual law you've broken, and you'll find that they can't. And if, if they're going to challenge your administration rights, so that's fine, they can challenge it, but they just need to provide proof of claim. Because um, you go to court, it's all based on presumption. So I've come to this court presuming that I'm the administrator of my own legal person. If you're claiming otherwise, that's fine, just show me proof of claim and we can move on. But okay, uh, but Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but they can't. They can't provide you proof of claim because, as I said, you're the sole shareholder. Do you remember ever giving these people administration rights? Of course not. And so they can't. They've got nowhere to go from there. And what about, you know, I went to down to the local <laughs> courthouse, Max, and um, I was very disappointed to see what I saw. Um, you know, it was very draconian, very draconian court, people, public gallery, and there's people going up one after the other in front of the judge, and so we went outside for a break, and I spoke to a solicitor there, and I said, is this a de facto court or a court de jour? And he said, it's a bit of both. And I said, but how can it be a bit of both? It has to be one or the other. And apparently he said, well, if the court gets out of bed, if the judge gets out of bed on one side, and it's a good day, he'll fine you. But if he gets out of bed on the other side, you'll go to jail. How, how can that system work? It's just, it's just incredible. I don't know whether you have the same issues down there. 
Oh, we do, mate. You do. I mean, you, you'll find these people just uh, enact their repressed biological urges upon the people that come to their court, basically. You know, if their, if their wife was nice to them the night before, then you might get off leniently. And that's the way it is. So there is no actual formula that they use. It just depends on what mood the judge is in. That's, that's madness. And what about, like, is there a big Freeman movement or sovereignty movement going on in Australia now? Well, look, there is, but it's, it's very difficult for people to find, find their way through it. I mean, a lot of people are getting in a lot of trouble because um, they're, they're going in wanting to attack the, the, the legal system. Uh, a lot of people do this. They get in, you know, they go down these rabbit holes and they, they want uh, ammunition so they can go in and take the judge on, go and stand in court and say, you've got no jurisdiction over me, rah, 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 I'm come here to tell you that. And the judge kind of looks at him and says, well, if I've got no jurisdiction over you, what are you doing in my court for a start? You know? And I, I don't want to take the system on. For me, the system doesn't exist. It's fiction. The whole thing is fiction. Um, there's only two types of law. That's God's law, which is trust law, and man's law, which is contract law. And people will go through and they'll say, oh, you know, common law, maritime amnesty law, whatever. As far as I'm concerned, it's all fiction. They're all contracts, all contract law. All Anything created by man is contract law. And God's law is, is simple. Just do no harm. Do no harm to, to creation. Follow, follow the one law of creation and serve creation, and that's it. You know, improve reality by your presence in it. If you do no harm to no other person or no other living thing, then how have you broken any law? And that's mm. my approach to the whole system. If, if you people are claiming otherwise, well, don't you claim to base your system on the laws of God? According to the laws of God, if you look at Matthew 22, which is uh, the whole basis of your legal system, it, they ask Christ, what, it, what is the, the one commandment? Christ says, love thy Lord God with all thy heart, all thy body, and all thy mind. And the second uh, greatest commandment is to love thy neighbor as thyself. And I'll say, well, that's what I do. So if you're claiming that I have to deviate from that path, you're claiming to be a higher authority than God, and I need to see proof of claim because you base your legal system on the laws of God, apparently, so you tell us. So if you're mm-hmm. asking me to break those two commandments... Who are you people? You're, you're telling me you base your legal system on the laws of God and that you're going to, yet you're going to change his commandments. So how does this work? And they have no recourse. They have nowhere they can possibly go from there. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree with you. I, I have two commandments, if you want to call them that. And the two commandments are very simple, for me anyway. Uh, the first one is to believe in God or your perception of God because people perceive God differently. So wherever you perceive God to be, and the second one is, uh, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Very simple. They're my two commandments. Well, that's it. That's exactly what it says in Matthew 22. I mean, and, and that's the basis of their whole legal system. I'm not particularly religious at all. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of God. We, we, God is an, uh, is an individual perspective, what you perceive your creator to be. God is different for everybody. But the thing is, I mean, whether you believe in God or not, you've got to understand that, I mean, I bring it up all the time because... That is the basis of their legal system. That's what they use. And it's all, all stems around Matthew 22 and those, those two commandments. So if that's what they're going to use, well, that's fine. I'll use that too. And that, that trumps them. That's the trump card. That They've got, got absolutely nowhere to go from there because they cannot establish jurisdiction over you if you stand in who and what you are. I've been in court and the judge has said, look, what's your name? And I'll say, man. And they'll get frustrated and frustrated and they end up asking for my birth certificate and I, the, you know, the, the, the clerk of the court will hand the judge the birth certificate and the, the judge just looked at it and read out my name and held it up and said, is this you? And I say, no, that's a piece of paper. I'm over here. I'm man. I'm not a piece of paper, you know. And I've actually had situations where the judge is, is saying, look, you need a psychiatric evaluation. You say, well, hang on a minute. You've just questioned whether I'm man without consulting an anthropologist. You've just asked me if I represent myself and obviously I am myself. And now you're asking me if I'm a piece of paper. And you're telling me that I need a psychiatric evaluation. You don't even appear to be able to speak English. You know? <laughs> and I've got nowhere to go. They've got nowhere they can go from there, you see. See, having all this information is, is fantastic. And, you know, to be able to go into court, if that ever happens, because obviously what people are concerned about is the fact that, um, I don't know whether in your time, in, since you've been learning about this stuff, whether you've had issues with banks and mortgages and bills and credit card companies, does that, is that anything that you've dealt with? 
Well, I don't have any credit cards. I don't have any mortgages. I don't even have a mobile phone. I've never gone down the plastic uh, avenue. I've, I've never, ever had plastic money. I've always paid for things in cash. If I've wanted something, I've saved up for it. Um, I've just never participated in that system, so I've never had to deal with any of that sort of stuff, no. Okay, so you're lucky that way. Because, obviously, the thing is with courts. Now, a typical example is we did have a, a sovereign person that we interviewed not so long ago, and the police arrested him, would you believe, because he was sitting on the grass in a public area. And he didn't attend. He got a fine or something, and he um, or an invitation to go to court. He didn't attend. So they came along and um, picked him up. They had a, a, a warrant to pick him up. And they brought him into court, and he stood in court, and basically they, they sent him to jail for, I think he said eight hours. That was Kevin. I remember in the interview, oh, Kevin, yeah, 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 they sent him to jail for eight uh, eight hours. Now, obviously, if they, you know, we can say n- what one of the things that we were doing over here, and we're pretty pretty much, um, we work a bit with TNS Radio. I'm sure you heard of Vin and Harry on TNS Radio. Probably have been on there. Um, and does the no contract return the sender? I don't know you. I don't recognise you. Sticker on this, these commercial documents that come through the post. Now we're going to have. Um, a property um, kind of tax that they're going to introduce now with the new budget over here and water charges. So not only are they fluoridating their water, killing us, but they're going to pay, ask us to pay for it. So my advice to people will be to get no contract, return the sender and stick it in the post and send back. What would you recommend in, in that situation? Yeah, I reckon that would work. No contract, return to sender, absolutely. Um, we've found also you can um, write letters often to establish um, who, who actually has the jurisdiction as well. If you're having charges brought against you by the Crown, you can write a letter off and establish which Crown it is because often you'll find it's not the, uh, it's not the woman, it's actually the Crown Corporation. But um, we've been sending off uh, notices of understanding to the Attorney General. If you, get a, um, if you get a summons to go to court, they usually give you 21 days or something before you've got to appear in court. If you can send off to the legal head of the legal department in your country, I don't know who it would be in Ireland, but in Australia it's the Attorney General, and you set it off and say, well, look, I've got this, this, this birth certificate here, I've got this trust agreement, it, it appears to be a trust agreement, I believe I have my, uh, my, my right to um, appoint myself as, as my own administrator in this account, and blah, 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 could you please correct me if I'm wrong, send it off as affidavits, and you get all these letters back, they can't, they can't um, correct you because you're not wrong. You basically say, look, I've got this trust agreement here. I can see my parents are the grantor. I can see myself as the beneficiary. And I can see that it's signed by the Registrar of Birth, Deaths and Marriages, which indicates the government is the trustee. Could you please correct me if I'm wrong? Because seeing as how this trust agreement exists, I believe I have the right to appoint myself my own administrator. Please correct me if I'm wrong. If you don't correct me, it will be taken as acquiescence that this is what's going on here and that I'm able to do this. If they don't hear back from you, I mean, you send it off as an affidavit, you give them 10 days or something to respond, you get the receipt, you've got this letter that they've agreed with you because they didn't respond, you send off a certificate of default, and then you can lodge those documents with the court along with your summons. Here we go. This is the morning I'm supposed to appear. Go to court. <clears throat> lodge the, uh, put these, um, enter these documents into the court record. We have agreement of the parties that there is no jurisdiction in the matter. We've settled out of court. Thank you, but I won't be appearing. I mean, that, that's one way that the Dean goes about it, and I know other people here that have gone about it that way, and they've, they've had success. So that, that's one way you can go about it. See, just not appearing, just not showing up, may be, you know, it may give them an excuse to be able to come around and arrest you. And the thing is, people always want to take on the police officers as well. And these guys don't know. They're not employed for their intelligence. You know, if, if a police officer comes around to your house and wants to arrest you, I mean, I'll just go with them. I'll just say, well, look, are you going to get violent with me if I don't go? And they go, yes, we are. They go, okay, well, I'll go with you then, you know, and I'll go with you. And I say, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, whatever. Give me the summons. I'll, I'll deal with it through the court. And then I'll deal with it administratively by sending me the correct documents and establishing whether they actually have any jurisdiction or not. So you can, hmm. you can do it that way. Okay, so I suppose that you're right. You can say, I mean, one of the things Bob Menard would say is that you know, he's a peaceful guy, there's no need for violence, and he is going under um, protest and duress. And, you know, if they're going to take him away, they'll take him away. The same thing, if, if the police stop you and they ask for your your name, and he said, you know, do you want my legal or lawful name? And, you know, the policeman, well, if they 
if they if they don't know the difference between legal and lawful, well, they shouldn't be stopping it in the first place, really. Well, that's true as well. I mean, but police ask my name, and I'll say, my name's Man. And then they'll go through the whole thing, you know, well, what's your actual name? I say, well, again, you, you're saying I'm not a man. Um, you know, I mean, and then, but the first thing I'll say, as soon as the police comes and says anything to me, I'll usually say, yeah, I'm okay, mate. I, I don't need your assistance at the moment. And I go, oh, no, 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 we, 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 excuse me, we, we want to talk to you or whatever, you know. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, excuse me, is there, is there some controversy here that I'm involved in? I can't see that myself or my, my companions are involved in any controversy that would indicate we require the assistance of the police service at this time. I start asking them if they're public servants. And often they'll say to you these days, no, we're not. In Western Australia, I said um, to one of the police officers, are you a public servant? She said, no, I'm not. I'm a member of the Western Australian Police Department. I said, and you're not a public servant. Well, that would indicate to me that the Western Australian Police Department is not then a department of government, but must be a private company. Is this true? And she walked away. Wouldn't answer. Because mm. you can establish that they're not actually public servants anymore. And if they tell you they're not public servants, then you can ask them, are you then part of a company? Because if you're part of a company and you're attempting to have dealings with me, I need to see a contract that exists between myself and your company. If you are attempting to um, create a contract and, and get me to enter into a contractual agreement with you now, um, please please clarify what this contract is. And it kind of freaks them out a little bit because many of them know about this now. Okay, well, this is, this is, this is the thing. What we've found, what's happened before, is that because the police are given six months training only and then they're sent out, they actually don't know the law or they're not told the law. So then what they do is, you know, if you start getting smart, they're trying to make, they're trying to make it that you have a conflict with them and then they'll have jurisdiction to pull you out of the car and put cuffs on you. Yeah, well, they try to do that. That's why you've got to be nice to them. You can't argue with these guys. Like I said, they're not employed for their intelligence. If, if you get arrested or harassed by the police, that, that, you know, your objective is to get out of their company as quickly and painlessly as possible. And then you can deal with it through the, through the court system, through, you know, deal with it administratively. But, um, I mean, I, I don't have much of a problem with police. They just, they tend to leave me alone. Um, when I was over in Western Australia, I was, I was saying a lot of this sort of stuff to them, and there were people being arrested all around me, but they didn't actually arrest me. And a lot of people were, were wondering why, because I was being quite belligerent to these men, and um, they, they were just leaving me alone because I wasn't actually saying anything that they could use to arrest me. Everything I was saying was, was common sense, and I was simply asking questions. And if I yeah. made a statement, I'd back it up. Like I'd say, look, you know, this is this is terrorism. What you're doing to this woman is terrorism. And they kind of look at me, and then I give them the Oxford Dictionary definition of terrorism. So it's very important that you speak English when you're dealing with these people. When you go to court and everything like that, always make sure you're speaking English and not legalese. And, and let them know that you're speaking English. Like I said with the judge when he asked me if I was my birth certificate, and I said, no, that's a piece of paper. I'm over here. You know, you are speaking English, are you not? You've just asked me if I'm a piece of paper. Yeah. You know? So you've got to be, um, let them know that you're speaking English. That's the language that you're speaking. If they're putting other interpretations on the words, well, you don't understand them because you're speaking English and you're assuming that they are too. And this is the uh, understand and stand under situation where you don't stand under what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, you'd never understand anything they're saying. I mean, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, how, how can I even understand? What, what does this mean? I'm taller than you. How, how can you possibly even stand on top of me? How could I be under you? You know? Yeah. Understand we, that you're, you're speaking English, you know? That's it. We find that what we've kind of said with the legal system is, you know, even the solicitors, they're all in the same golf club. So they have no interest in rocking the boat, even if they're on two different sides, plaintiffs and defendants. Even if they're on two, two different sides, they don't really like rocking the boat because they're all in the same golf club and they'll only, you know, because they're part of the law society. And one thing that Bob Menard said, I have to say, which is quite good, is they say, well, when you're a part of the society, and he said, well, can you tell me the name of the society that we are part of? And they can't kind of, they wouldn't be able to give you a name. No, you know, no, well, they can't. That's the thing. But, um, I mean, Rob, Rob Bernard's, Rob Bernard is, is great. He really is. He's done a lot of really good work there. And, um, yeah, they won't ever be able to tell you the society that, you, that you're part of. But a lot of them do know and a lot of them don't know. But, like I said, it's, you, you can't really argue with a police officer. You've just got to, you just got to sort of, um, realize that they don't have any jurisdiction. A lot of them don't know it. 
But you just sort of go with it and then deal with it administratively. Don't get yourself in trouble with cops because they've got tasers, they'd like to use them, and, and some of them just, you know, they've got chips on their shoulders, and, and that's what they're employed to do. So don't don't try to take on police officers or, or get into arguments with police officers. They're just... They're just plebs out there doing doing what they're told, basically. And also, uh, uh, Max, as I know from from uh, being over in Australia many many years ago that your your police force uh, carry guns where airs don't. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Yeah, we got guns and tasers, and um, I found it's always good to tell them not to get excited as well. They're always telling that that to you, you know. Don't they calm down, mate. Please don't get excited. I say that to them all the time. Says, as soon as one of them butts in. And you know, if I'm talking to one and the other one butts in, I'll say, excuse me, don't get excited. Uh, you, you're carrying three deadly weapons on your belt there. I'm feeling a little bit in fear for my safety. And uh, so you sort sort of circumvent that before they can say it to you. Exactly. And, of course, you can record the conversation if you feel threatened by the situation as well, which people, some people aren't aware of. Well, according to the Listening Devices Act of Australia, you can actually record any conversation that you believe may affect you in a legal manner. And I would suggest that a conversation with a police officer fits squarely into that category. Under that same act, a video camera is actually classed as a listening device that happens to record pictures. So you can sit there and video a police uh, officer talking to you, and there's absolutely nothing they can do about it. If they tell you there's a law against it, ask them to name what law it is, and they won't be able to. Yeah, and chances are, if they did come up with some kind of law chances are it's going to be an actor statute, which isn't a law anyway. Exactly, exactly. It's not law. Everything they tell you is a law is not a law. And that's something I was saying to them as well over the, in Western Australia. There was a woman being arrested, and I said, well, what law is this woman broken? And the police said, well, she's in breach of the Traffic Act. And I said, Act? Is this a play? Are we in a play now? And he just looked at me and said, well, if you're going to be stupid, there's no point talking to you. And I said, no, I'm not being stupid. It's just that an act isn't a law. It's a statute. And a statute is... is regulations, it, it's, it's legislation given the power of law through consent of the governed. And, you know, are you a public servant? And he said, no, I'm not. And I said, well, there you go. And that, that means you're a private company. So you're, what you're doing is enforcing non-existent contracts against people and you're using violence if they don't comply with you. If you look up the Oxford English Dictionary definition of terrorism, is defined as violence or the threat of violence carried out against civilians as a means of coercion, often for political reasons. Is that not exactly what you are doing to this woman? And he just looked at me and walked away. Like, he looked at me like he wanted to bite my head off, you know. Mm. So he just, he had no recourse. He had to just walk away because he couldn't answer. Oh, you might, I, can just, I can just see that in a, a, a comedy situation where you'll say all that and he'll just look at you for a minute and go, I've got a big gun. <laughs> yeah, well that's the thing. Yeah. Well that's the thing, and then they'll, they will, they'll arrest you and they'll take you away, but okay, no worries, if you're gonna hurt me, fine, take me away, not a problem, I'll deal with it in the court. Then you exactly. go to the court and say, well yeah, I'm, as I said, is this not a court of law? Please explain what law I've broken, you yeah? know, how do you plea? Well I have no plea, I'm not a beggar, and besides that, I've been, not been presented with a valid law to plea to. Is this not a court of law? Show me a valid law that I've broken. And yeah. they've got no recourse. If you, if you understand what they're talking about and you understand how the court works and you make sure you always speak English in the court, then they, they really have, have nowhere to go. So just to, just to do a... We did a bit of role play with you and you, you went up and you were, you were there for, say, a traffic offence, say, speeding or something like that, or a parking ticket, and the judge said you were there and, and the, the judge called out your name. What process would you go through? I'd say, yeah, I'm here regarding that matter, and I'd stand up. Mm. If I wouldn't give them my name, I'd say, yes, I'm here regarding that matter. And then they'd say, are you Max Egan? And I'd say, well, I'm, I'm the man who was arrested the other day. Are you looking for the legal person? I, I, I'm the administrator of the name that you're calling. And I'll, they'll, then they'll get into an argument with you. I mean, I, how do you claim to be the administrator? Well, I, you know, I own all the equity in the name. If you're claiming I'm not the administrator, please uh, provide me with proof of claim and we can move forward. They can never get past that point. That, yeah. That's it. They've got nowhere to go past that point. And there's been times when actually Dean went to court and they, they called his name. He said, yeah, I'm here regarding that matter. And they said, are you Dean Clifford? He said, I'm the man who was arrested the other day. And they said, oh, yeah, is this this free man stuff? And they, he said, well, I don't know what you call it. I'm just here trying to you know, answer your questions. And the judge said to him, well, look, if you're not going to state your name, we're going to issue an arrest warrant in the name of the accused for failing to appear. 
And he said, well, thank you. Thank you for making that, that legal distinction because I've just told you that I'm the man who was arrested the other way and here I am standing in your court and now you're telling me you're going to uh, release a, a warrant for the arrest of the accused for failing to appear. So I guess I'm not the accused. Thank you for clearing that up for me. Have a nice day and walked out of the court and there's nothing they can do. That's, that's fantastic. Now, the one thing I want to talk to you about, Max, as well, is and something that we've talked about in, in the truth movement in itself, we, we know there's, there's certain, let's say, certain attitudes towards what's going on with the, the, the Illuminati, the New World Order, and all the global elite and everything else. And it's all about energy as well. I think there is a certain element of the truth movement who just see the physical and just believe in the physical, and that's all it is. But I personally think, and I think Steve does to a certain extent as well, that there's more to it than just a the physical. There's energy here. Energy is being manipulated and controlled in a negative way, and it's it's. And I don't know wh- how you feel about that or what w- your thoughts are on that. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's an energetic universe even more than it is uh, a biological universe. You know, your body is energetic more than anything. You're an electrical being, and everything that goes on uh, is energetic based. It's it's all energy based. Just just. Um, the way they keep people in fear, this whole society is based in fear. Your education system is based in fear. Your social structure is based in fear. It's all based in fear. Everything. It's fear-based mind control. Everything that, that we are in. You know, everything. I mean, your fear of not having enough money to pay your rent, to whether your, your electricity is going to be cut off, whether you can buy food, whether the police are going to pull you up as you're, as you're going uptown or whatever. It's all based in fear. Fear, fear of living up to what your peers expect you to be, you know? It's, it's all based in fear. We're giving all these, giving all these yardsticks by the television that we have to measure ourselves up to. And yeah, energy is everything. I mean, ultimately everything is made of energy. Your body is, is energy. I mean, your body's 85% water. It, it operates on electrical fields more than anything. And so if they can keep people in this electromagnetic soup and just feed them fear, that's how they control reality, and they're, they're very, very good at it. Mm. Now, I, I totally agree. One of the things that we've talked about before on the show, and we've had a few people on talking about this, is the, the control and the manipulation, as you say. There's only two emotions, that's love and fear. And we have to decide, when we kind of grow up and wake up and realize who we are, and uh, that we're part of the, the universal, universal consciousness. And I kind of say we're... Um, we are spiritual beings experiencing life in physical form. End of. Absolutely. There's no kind of yeah, there's no kind of, you know, there's no borders and there's no different nationalities. We're just energy. Absolutely. We, we're all energy and we all come from the same source. And we, we all are literally one. There, we, there is re- literally only one of us here experiencing itself subjectively. And, and people say, oh, I'm, not, I'm not one. I want to be an individual. Well, you know, you're not individual. You're unique. Um, you know, you're a unique expression of consciousness. Your your body, your biological computer is is tuned to only one frequency in the entire field, and that's what you experience as you. But I am tuned to a different frequency from that same field that I experience as me. So we are quite literally each other. Because my body computer is different to your body computer, it's a completely different frequency, and so I'm completely unique. I have an absolutely unique perspective of reality that nobody else will ever have because nobody else can ever be me, and it's the same with you. So we can be completely separate and different and unique from each other, but at the same time, we come from the same source, and we are literally one with each other at the same time. That's how it works, and that, that's absolutely how it works. And that's something that people have, have a very hard time getting their head around. I was at a, um, one of the Occupy meetings recently. I was speaking to the crowd trying to help provide them with a little bit of direction because I'm not seeing a lot from them. And there was a bunch of feminists there. And I was speaking out about Julia Gillard and, and some of the stuff that these psychopathic women that run this country are doing. And one of them piped up and said, stop saying negative things about women. And I'm like, you only, you only heard the women part, didn't you? It doesn't matter whether they're men or women. It doesn't matter what they are. And you sitting there saying, I'm an empowered woman. I'm an empowered feminist. All you're saying is, I live in this little box here. Which little box do you live in? And I say, you're not, you're not an empowered feminist. You're, you're the infinite consciousness of creation experiencing that. 
You know, you're just experiencing a woman, but, but ultimately you come from the same source as me. Get over the gender hump. Stop making this differentiation between men and women because your soul is male, female. Your soul doesn't decide what it's going to be until it comes into your body and decides which, which gender it's going to experience. But when you get out of this body and you get back into the infinite field of consciousness that is the universe, gender is, is completely and utterly irrelevant. It, it makes no sense at all and has no bearing on anything. So you've got to get over that division, that divisionist um, view of reality that people have and they're trained to have. You can probably um, do that quote from Bill Hicks. You probably know it well by now. Uh, which, which one's that? The one that you're in infinite consciousness and we're just experiencing this life. Do you know that one? Yeah, Central that um, life is life is like a, a ride on a on a roller coaster. It's like a ride on a Ferris wheel, a ride in an amusement park, and we make of it what we will. I think I've got that quote on my website actually on the homepage. Yeah, it's it's, it's very good. It's actually a very very good quote. Um, the what's your take on the whole 2012 scenario and this comma Ellen and the energy changes and all that kind of stuff? Look, I'm not really, um, a lot of people look at all these celestial events and they, they, they get into them, they get into this state of fear. I think they're, they're just waiting for something terrible to happen. I, I'm not concerned at all about any celestial events. I, I don't think that there's anything I can do about them if they are going to happen. And I don't have any fear of death. I, I, I believe that I'm here to experience max. I'm here to improve reality as much as I can by my presence in it. I'm here to um, to attempt to bring balance back to the world like so many other people. And I have no fear of any celestial events. I think all will unfold the way it, it should. I think 2012 is, I think it's almost like a tipping point. I think we reach the point of no return. If, if, we, haven't, if we haven't made positive steps towards uh, our, our conscious evolution and, and moving to, to greater heights of consciousness by that time, then I think we may be dragged into another another place we don't really want to go. I think that's the time when the species may split in two. I think a very interesting part about uh, December twenty first, twenty twelve, is the uh, is the whole Federal Reserve set up. The way the um, the Federal Reserve was actually created on on or the Federal Reserve Act went went through on December twenty second, uh, nineteen thirteen. And it actually runs out, it's a 99-year lease on the building, and it actually runs out on uh, December 21st, 2012. Yeah, I heard something about that, all right. Um, and there seems to be, somebody said it to me the other day, and I didn't take much notice of it uh, before then, but if you look at your credit cards, um, obviously you don't have any, so you probably don't see them, but if you look at the credit cards, a lot, a lot of the expiry dates are, 20, are 2012. Yeah, funny that, isn't it? Well, they don't expect this. They don't expect this financial system to last past 2012. I don't think. That's why they want to get all this carbon trading in, or ca cap and trade, because um, look, we've just gone through the whole petrodollar thing. The last you know 20, 30 years, it's all been based on the petrodollar, and now they want to base it all on the carbon dollar. So I think they'll keep propping the economies up until December 2012. I don't think we'll see a major crash be between uh, between now and then. Or maybe maybe after the end of the London Olympics, maybe between the London Olympics and December 2012, we'll see a major global meltdown, I think. There has been a, bit, a lot of rumours regarding 2012 and this false flag. Um, a number of issues have come up. Now, next week on the show, we have a, a lady called Dr. Carol Rosen, who worked with Werner von Braun, and one of the things he said, um, he said there's three ways that they're going to manipulate the system. The first one's going to be the Cold War, the second one's going to be terrorism and rogue nations, and the third one's going to be a fake UFO attack. Um, now, it's just curious that von Braun has said that, and then we've other people coming in saying, well, if you look at the 2012 Olympics, what a prime time. If they're going to do something, I mean, I was watching a video today which Steve sent over to me about um, a possible uh, attack on the 2012 Olympics where it'll be a nuclear attack a small nuclear attack and there'll be thousands of people killed which will give them the shout to bring in a curfew and it's a bit like V for Vendetta the movie I mentioned as well I don't know if you've seen that movie Max yeah yeah um, great movie fantastic that's movie right, fantastic that's movie it. the same kind of principle with that is the control of the people and the, the, the control of the media so there's so many different kind of scenarios. Now, one of our listeners here 
said, um, and we've talked about Alexander Ratchoff before. Have you, uh, how you wants to know um, what are your, do you have any comments regarding Alexander Ratchoff? Look, I think that uh, um, it's very, very likely that we will see some type of some type of alien scenario, some type of fake alien invasion. It seems to be right on the cards. There have been a spate of alien invasion movies lately, and uh, I, I think it's absolutely on the cards, and it wouldn't surprise me at all. And like you say, Werner von Braun's been right with everything else he said so far, and he was an insider. I mean, the guy was a Nazi, you know. And, and yeah, that's something well, people don't understand as well about what happened after World War Two, is they brought all these Nazis in there, and then they set up NASA and the NSA and the CIA, and these are all Nazi-based groups, and they went out and extrapolated what, what they did in Germany out across the rest of the world. Because the Nazis didn't actually lose the war, the war in Germany. The, Germany did. It wasn't the Nazis who lost. They all got smuggled out all through the Vatican. They all came to America and South America and probably went to England and Australia as well. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, it was Germany yeah. that lost, not the Nazis. The Nazis were simply like a, a like a special ops division of the Illuminati, if you like. That, that's the way I look at the whole thing. I look at World War Two as being a giant hoax. It was just a beta test so they could figure out how to do it and then extrapolate it out across the rest of the world. And what we see with the UN is basically an extension of the Third Reich they went out and, and set up military bases in 168 countries to keep us safe from anyone like Hitler ever rising up again. This terrible menace that they just saved us from, that they financed and propped up and gave him everything he needed to conduct the war. They, um, they actually, yeah, I, I, mean, I have to agree with that. The, the Third Reich never went away. They just found ways of improving the system over the years. Absolutely. Mm, I, I think that NASA's full of Nazis. It was set up by the Nazis anyway. I think originally, um, well, especially it, with Von Braun and all them, the Project Paperclip. Well, it was. I mean, it was. The NSA, the CIA, NASA, all of these organizations were all set up by Nazi think tanks, all of them. And NASA's okay. just been used to, to extract lots and lots of money from the U.S. economy for black budgets. That's all it's really been used for. Well, believe it or not, you just mentioned that we've just found a deficit in air budget over here in Ireland for three point what billion? Three point six billion. billion. Yeah. We found the de deficit, and they made a mistake on the books. So that's um, that's something that came up. We got another question for you, Max, from uh, Dan and Michelle. They want to know what does Max think of the U.S. and Israel? Uh, will they attack Iran? Absolutely, they will. Yeah, they're, they've been itching to do this for a very, very long time. Iran's one of the only um, free nations left on the planet, really, and they absolutely want to attack Iran the way they just did with, with Libya. What they just did in Libya was absolutely shocking. Uh, yeah. the, all the work that Gaddafi had done, the great man-made river, all the aquifers, one of the first things they bombed was the aquifers and, and the great man-made river and all the water courses that he'd built. Um, yeah, it was absolutely shocking. And yeah, I, I believe they will. They've been itching, itching to do so for a long time. The only thing that will stop them will be um, uh, popular opinion. If, if the people of the world can wake up and realise what's going on here, and realise that our governments are simply public trustees. They're out of control. We've allowed our our servants to take over the mansion, and we need to um, we need to um, start steering the ship of state ourselves. I think if people can wake up to that, we can turn things around. But if if they don't, then we're heading for a very very uh, tricky situation, a very dangerous situation. Well, I said Max, and I've said it last week on the show that you know we heard about. Probably, I think I said it earlier on that. We hear about the White Hats and about things happening and certain people commenting about what the White Hats are doing and what's going on. But I, I kind of said, maybe I'm just a bit sceptical, but I keep seeing chemtrails in the sky and I don't see anything happening positive. And, you know, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just being sceptical, but I just kind of feel that, well, surely we should be seeing something positive if these things are going on. Well, I think a lot of it is as well as to get keep people uh, inactive it's okay the white hats are there they're into bat for me someone's gonna save me i don't ever have to actually save myself or do anything myself or stand up and speak out about anything myself i know about all this stuff but i don't have to do anything about it because there's all these people behind the scenes that are going to look after me and that's where i think all that's going um what's going on with the chemtrails is absolutely insidious there's a lot of new research uh, that's been coming out about what's actually in chemtrails and there appears to be um, biological agents, nanoparticles, smart dust, all sorts of stuff going on in the chemtrails. It would indicate that uh, the human race is actually being genetically modified. 
we're actually being merged with machine now, um, going into transhumanism and posthumanism. It's not coming. It's it's here now, and they're okay. they're doing it to people now without our knowledge or consent. And I think that's also ties in with the genie program, with all the um, all the electrical grid that they're putting around the, the planet, all the smart meters, all of this sort of stuff that they're bringing in. Because again, we we operate um, electrically, energetically more than anything else. So I think mm. you can put all these these nanoparticles in people and then affect them with electromagnetic signals from outside their body to cause changes within their body. Uh, that that's where I think we're going with the chemtrails. And nobody's really noticing it because too many people are waiting to be saved. Whether they're being saved by ascension or 2012 is coming and the world's going to change or, or the white hats are going to look after me or common elements going to come and change the world. There's going to be a cataclysm. Whatever it is, I don't have to do anything about it because it's all going to change around me. That's what's being promoted through all of these types of attitudes, I think. So there's a lot of, I mean, I kind of have said on the show that there is a lot of disinformation out there. And we need to be active. We need to be doing something. We need to start waking people up big time. Um, yeah, we, we, you know, we've heard so much information, but the one thing that the New World Order are great at doing is separating out different groups and then throwing out the disinformation to these groups. And maybe some infighting as well in between the groups, because we know the truth movement has been infiltrated on a number of, um, of, of situations where people have gone in and destroyed certain groups because of certain things that have, have happened. So, well, I think that out of this conversation, I think what we've had to say to people is, look, we need to start, you need to be doing something rather than nothing. Nobody's going to come and knock at the door and going to save you. You're going to have to start getting up and doing something yourself. Now, over here in Ireland, we do have an Occupy movement in, in, in the city centre, but I don't know, Occupy movements, do they work? I mean, is it happening in Australia? Well, there's Occupy movements here, but again, there's no direction for them. I went and spoke to them recently and said, look, what is the direction of the group? You're sort of kind of here camping in the in the centre of town, but you don't know what you're doing. You know, what, what are you speaking out about? What what do you want, hope to achieve? What what sort of goals have you got? And um, they, they really couldn't name anything. And I, I was saying to them, well, look, the, the problem really is that people are enslaved to, to this system of fear, which is a monetary base, so we need to address the money system, absolutely. But we need to realise this, this trust agreement exists, that our governments are in breach of trust. These people are just people. Because they write laws or statutes on pieces of paper, which gives them the right to come and destroy your lives and destroy the country, it doesn't mean we have to let them do it. Because these are just rules that they've written on pieces of paper. You know, ultimately, what we have to do is we have to break down the, the, the barriers that exist between ourselves and our neighbours. You know, stop saying I'm an empowered female, I'm an empowered male, I'm, I'm indigenous, I'm black, I'm white, I'm this, I'm that. All you're saying is I live in this little box. You know, ultimately we're all here together and we have to stand up together. The only way we're going to do it is if we, we see each other as valid. You know, everybody around you is just as valid as you. Everybody has that unique perspective of reality that is all their own, but ultimately come from the same place, the same consciousness as you. We have to see these people as valid, and we have to stand together to, to, to address these problems. That's the only way we're going to do it. Sure, we have to wake people up, and we have to speak to people, but we have to do it from the correct energetic state. Don't do it out of fear. I mean, I know who and what I am, and I won't take a backward step to anyone. I won't attack anyone, but I won't take a backward step to them. And that's the way we, we've got to approach things, I believe. It's all energetic. It's, it's all really, really energetic. And you can't wait for people to save you. You've got to stand up in your power yourself, know who and what you are, and, and speak to your employees and, and put them back in their correct position in the social hierarchy. But it, it takes numbers to do it. It absolutely takes numbers. And the only way we're going to have those numbers is if we break down these barriers that we believe exist between ourselves and our neighbours because they're all contrived. They've all been put there for us. And as far as what people say in the truth movement and, and whether the white hats are doing this and whether this is happening or that's happening, there's a, there's a, a quote by Buddha. And Buddha said, Believe nothing, no matter where you read it or who said it, no matter even if I have said it unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. And that's what people have to keep in mind. Always believe themselves and believe what their intuition and their common sense tells them. But don't wait to be saved because you have to do it for yourself.
Well, the, the, good, the good feeling, always believe your good feeling. That's what I always say. Go with that. Time and time again, I've been in situations where the good feeling is to... We've all done it. We've, you know, the good feeling is not to do something, and we go against it, and we do it, and go, you know, we shouldn't have done that. And well, it's your what, intuition. Your intuition telling you what you should do, and you should always listen to your intuition because it never lies. Exactly, and that's the truth there. The, um, yeah, we, see, the problem is over here in Ireland, no matter how bad the situation is over here, but so far, anyway, there seems to be an awful lot of apathy. Now, we know that the, the water is fluoridated. I'm not going to just blame it on that. But the water over here is fluoridated, and it just seems that if the, the government keeps dishing out all these, you know, here's, here's another bill, here's council tax, property tax, water tax, whatever they want to call it, all these charges are coming out, and people just keep taking it. They just keep taking it. And I just, you know, it's going to have to crack somewhere, you know. And, um, I mean, I don't know, as you say, in Australia it might be a little bit different. I don't know whether your, your water is fluoridated. Are you getting rational thinking over there um, from people, or are people beginning to give out over there and do the same thing? Well, most of the country's fluoridated. Fortunately, it's not where I live. We had a huge campaign, and we stopped them fluoridating the water here. And this is probably the only place in the country that isn't fluoridated. But, yeah, Australia, I mean... Um, yeah, I call the place Apathralia. Unfortunately, it's it's a very very apathetic population. But you know, hopefully they will they will get roused now that now that our water is under attack and all the fracking that that's been carried out around the country. I'm really hoping that fracking and coal seam gas mining is what is going to unite the globe, because this is our water. And if people can get it through their heads that now they're attacking our water. And this is just the basic building block of life. This is, you know, when you look out into space, the first thing you look for if you're looking for life is water on another planet. So mm -hmm. this is really, really important. And people might just realize that if they're willing to trash the water table in order to support their economy, then, then maybe we need to look at things because these people will keep going until they turn Earth into Mars and they'll still be trying to balance their books. And mm -hmm. essentially it's a fictional system. It's, it's not important whether the books are balanced. What's important is, is whether, you know, reality is balanced, you know, our society is balanced, our, whether our, our world supports life because it's in balance. That's what's important, and, and people might realise that through this fracking. Yeah, well, as I say, we would love to have somebody on to talk about fracking, but they obviously don't want to come on the show, um, which is disappointing because we're all trying to help each other and support each other and get the information out there. And if anything, I thought, you know, it'd be beneficial for them, but... Maybe we will get somebody on. We'll find somebody that has an open mind and understand where we're coming from. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Max. We're going to go to a, a quick musical break, and we'll just be back after this break. Okay? Not a problem. And we're back. That was Jackie Graham breaking away. You're listening to Open Your Mind Internet Radio with Alan Steve, and our special guest tonight is Max Egan uh, from Australia. We'd like to uh, say a big thank you to Vin and the boys at TNS and also to UWS, United We Strike Radio, for streaming us. I think we're, we're, we're gone off those streams now because they, they, they do their own thing at 9 p.m. So we're going into overdrive at the request of some of our, some of our listeners. So, uh, yeah, hopefully. Okay. Well, this, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, um, we're going to talk to Max up to about quarter past nine. And if Sean is around, if Sean is listening to the show, we'll get Sean to dial in about quarter past nine or so when Max is finished. And then if Sean wants to give us an update on uh, what's happening in New York, because we are keeping an eye on things there and what's happening over there in the States. And Sean has been fantastic at reporting the news and telling us what's going on. So, Max, um, again, it's been brilliant to have you on the show. For the few minutes that we have left, can you give us your words of wisdom on all the experience that you've built up from being a sovereign person and what you've seen with the New World Order and Illuminata? What would you... What advice would you recommend to people listening into the show now? Well, I think, like I've often said, the whole system is based on fear-based mind control. The most important thing people can do is to get out of fear. They really do, because it's the fear that keeps people divided from their neighbours. You've got to understand that, that your neighbours are in this just as much as you are, even if they're asleep. Um, people are only asleep because they've been trained to be asleep. And even people that have wronged you, they've only wronged you because of, of what the system's done. The system has given them this belief in reality which has caused them to wrong you and it's because they're disconnected from reality. We've got to let all of this go and we've got to move forward from this point. It doesn't matter what anybody did. 
because the system trained them to do that. You know, consciousness, human consciousness at the moment is so um, convoluted and disconnected from itself because it's been trained to be that way. And, and realizing that it's, it is this way and that it's, it's been trained to be this way is, is half the battle. It really is. So if you can put all these things behind you and just move forward, connect with the people around you and build strong community within your community so that you, you can depend on your neighbors and you're a dependable person yourself. And once we have this, this camaraderie amongst the people around us, we have the ability to stand up and change anything. That, I think, is the most important thing we can do to fight this system. There's no point going and building an alternate society, you know, run, running off to escape and build an alternate community in the woods because they'll just come and pick you off later. And there's nowhere you can hide on this planet from this system. There's nowhere to escape. You'd have to leave the planet to escape this system. So you have to take the bull by the horns. And, and when you realize that everything about our society is constructed to create division, there's a huge clue there. Obviously, the answer is unity. So you need to unite with the people around you and, and respect the people around you and treat them as yourself. Exactly. And they have to, and people have to realize that, um, if you hurt, you know, if you hurt somebody around you, you're hurting yourself as well in, in the long run. You know, it's all, to me anyway, I'm a big believer of the, 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 the universal law of karma. And it's like the, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, that doesn't exist. Well, you know, people don't have to believe in the law of gravity, but if you jump off a building, you're going to get killed. And I do think that the universal law of karma applies as well. Because energy, it, for me, is neutral. It's how you use it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is. I mean, karma, karma's there and people will experience their own karma, but it's not up to you to inflict their karma on them for them because you're just attracting your own karma by doing so. And I've often said to people, when, when you, uh, when someone hurts you or wrongs you and you decide you're going to take revenge on them and hurt them or wrong them, all you're doing is saying it's okay for them to have wronged you because that's what people do because now I'm going to do it to you because I'm exactly the same as you and you're doing exactly that which you hate. You know, you, you felt so bad when someone wronged you and yet you are so willing to go and inflict that upon someone else and so you, you just become what you hate. And so you, exactly. you, you've got to, you've really got to look at how it works. And it's not up to the individual to, to inflict karma on someone else because you're just attracting it to yourself. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I totally agree with that. Uh, Steve, you got a question there? Question in from Kel from Max. Uh, can you ask Max about the new carbon tax in Australia, please? Uh, Kel says, he says that he hears there's a lot of tension around about that at the moment. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this government was uh, elected on the premise that they weren't going to introduce carbon tax, but of course they have introduced carbon tax. And like they're doing this in Australia and New Zealand because the whole green agenda, the whole whole uh, global warming, climate change agenda is, is dead in the water everywhere around the world. It's, it's dead in Europe. It's dead in America. The climate gate emails, I mean, this exposed the whole thing. What happened at the Co Copenhagen... Um, meeting a couple of years ago it, it basically exposed the whole thing but australia has been insulated from that and the media here is still pushing uh, climate change and all this sort of stuff so they're still seeing it as an issue now that they've introduced it in australia and new zealand and now we see julia gillard saying that because the australian economy is so buoyant she needs to bail out europe or bail out greece uh, julia gillard literally wants the australian economy to bail out greece so this gets Greece dependent upon Australia. Australia, of course, has just introduced carbon tax. And so this is a way of getting this carbon tax dollar, this, this carbon trading uh, scheme out to the world. Because if we can get the world in debt to Australia and Australia operates with cap and trade, then this is how it's going to be extrapolated out to the rest of the world. Well, how, how are they going to do that with the, your indigenous species there, or indigenous na natives, uh, the Maoris, isn't it? Is it the Maoris? No, just the Australian Aboriginal. Yeah, uh, Australian Aboriginal. How, how are they going to put a, um, a carbon tax in, on the natives? Well, they're just taking all their land. I mean, what, what we've seen here with native title and with all the mining and fracking and intervention in the Northern Territory, these people are just losing all their land. They won't be an issue. They're just sweeping them under the carpet, basically. Uh, with the guise of helping them and freeing them and offering them their land back and all of this sort of stuff. It, it's, it's, it's so insidious what they're doing. See, the, the Australian government, the, the Crown Corporation, has no claim to Australia. 
there was no treaty ever signed. The, the original owners of Australia are still the owners of Australia, and they're trapping them with this native title stuff. Um, people are getting to be able to apply for native title. You can, you know, if you're an original person, you can put in a native title claim for a certain section of land. You can claim back any land that was previously colonised by the Crown. And they're signing this. But what they're, by signing it, what, what they're saying is that the land was previously colonised by the Crown. So it was owned by the Crown. And then the, the Crown, now that they've got land back, the Crown imposes all these land taxes and rates and things upon them that they can't pay. So within a couple of years, they take their land from them. So look, we gave it to the Aboriginal people. They couldn't keep up the payments on the taxes and the land rates and they just couldn't manage their land and so they, they ended up losing it and now it's ours. That's the way they're doing it. And they're just going in and, and steamrolling across these people. There's a, um, a thing I've actually got posted on the, on the website called um, Fortescue Metals Group and the Great Native Title Swindle. If you go and have a look at that, it'll show exactly how they're stealing the land from the original owners. So it's just not an issue for them at all. That's, a, that's, a, that's really, I mean, that's, that's just bad. That's, that's really bad. I mean, <clears throat> this, this system... You know, it has to come down, Max. The system has to come down. Do you know, it just, I mean, with the, the financial system, I mean, we had Lindsay Williams on and we had Bob Chapman on the show and they were talking about the dollar and what's happening with that. And Lindsay Williams forecast that by December 2012, the dollar will be dead in the water. What's happening with the currency? You've got the dollar in Australia, the Australian dollar. Um, what do you think is going to happen globally and obviously with your monetary system over there? Well, it's going to collapse, absolutely, and it will probably collapse, as I said, between August uh, 2012 and December 2012. You've got to understand the lease on the Federal Reserve runs out in December 2012. So they'll, they'll collapse it by then for sure, absolutely. And the whole, the whole global system will go down. And the only way to deal with it, the only way we can deal with this at all is th- th- this system has to be dismantled. And the only way we can do it is by uniting with the people around us. We can only do it if we've got strong community. We've got to realise that our governments are in breach of trust. All these people are are public trustees. That's all they are. They go to office, they swear to serve the people of their nation, but they're not doing so. And we've got to realise that it is a trust agreement. These people are entrusted with our share of the common wealth of our nation, and they're stealing from us. They're stealing everything they can from us, and they're basically selling the whole lot out to overseas interests, and they want to turn the whole place into China. You notice China's out there investing in everywhere at the moment. China basically owns the world economy at the moment. And the reason they want this to happen is because of the Chinese work ethic. They're very, very regimented work ethic. And that's what they want all around the world. And once China has a, a large enough foothold economically in all of our countries, that's what will be introduced. And the only thing that's going to stop it is the people. And the only way the people are going to stop it is if we break down these divisions that we have with each other. The, these contrived fictional divisions that we've been trained to have with each other. Stop seeing the people around you as a threat. Stop seeing them as being any different to yourself. We are all in this together. This is why I finish every radio show that I do with Inla Kesh. I am another yourself. That is the way to fix reality. I firmly believe that once we can approach people in that respect, always treat, treat other people as ourselves and see everybody else as valid, we can stand up together and we can change things very, very easily. But we're never going to do it while we remain divided from each other and continue to have stuff with our neighbours. Mm. Totally agree, totally agree. Well, Max, it's, um, it's been a pleasure having you on the show and definitely we'd love to have you on again. I'm sure there's loads more stuff that we can talk about. Um, what I'll do is go to pass over to Steve and Steve, you do your little bit. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm awake now. <laughs> uh, yeah, Max, normally at the end of the show we just ask our guests... Uh, because there may be other people out there who are not familiar with Max Egan and Max Egan's work. So if you want to maybe give out some contact details, uh, a website, or if you're working on a book or DVD or, or anything that you want to promote, now, now is your chance to, if you want to do that, Max. Okay, well, the website is thecrowhouse.com. You'll find everything that I've done on that website. You'll find a book that I've written there for free. You'll find the five films that I've made are all there for free. I'm working on a new film at the moment uh, called Transformation. That features myself and Ben Stewart and Freeman, David Icke's in it, um, a lot of lot of people, Henrik from Red Ice is in it, a lot of people in the film, and I'm having a hard time getting the time to work on it at the moment, but it, it will be out soon, 
And, yeah, it's all there. It's all on the crowhouse.com. I do a weekly radio show. That's always posted on the website. It's always posted on YouTube. You'll find everything that I've done right there. Brilliant. Okay. That's well, as I say, Max, it's been a, a big pleasure for you to, uh, uh, a big pleasure for us for having you on the show. I really enjoyed it and I'd love to have more time. I mean, I know it's early over there. So maybe what we might do is next time is we'll get you on a, and we'll actually probably go on for the two hours just to, um, just to go through because as I say, I've listened to a lot of your stuff and, um, I think it's just fantastic information and we just can't cram it in in an hour and 15 minutes. It's just impossible. But I think what you're saying about the trust is very, very important for people to, um, to look into that and to research it and to see what's involved. And I think you do have, I'm just trying to think, the interview you had with Dean talking about this, can you tell us, they, they, will they find that on your website? They will, absolutely. If you go to my website, you'll see a banner at the top that's got Lessons in Trust Law. And you'll find the interview that I had with Dean there. You'll find other interviews that Dean's done. You'll find all of Dean's workshops on there as well. And uh, other interviews with just me talking about it. I, I try to put everything I can on that page. Everything, Every interview that I do relating to trust law, I try to put on that page. Brilliant stuff, brilliant. Okay, Max, well, listen, again, thanks very much for coming on the show. 